many of us experience, especially as we grow deeper into the practice, as the practice becomes not just something we do once or twice a week, or a retreat a couple times a year, but when it really starts to be like breathing for us, where it really, not even the sitting, but where just the view of don't know, of letting go of thinking, of seeing from the perspective of don't know, the suffering and the traps of life. Often, some of us uh, experience a kind of a conflict, not even, almost an alienation sometimes, maybe if you're in a relationship, if you're in a partnership, a marriage, uh, or even in your social environment, kind of like you can experience a kind of estrangement in some way, at some level, from the way of being to which you had been very accustomed and accommodated for many years, and suddenly it seems weird to live like that. Not anything about materialism or whatever, although that's part of it. Just the, the unnecessary complication and, and shallowness, the empty busyness, the cheap joys and pursuits of so much of, doesn't mean of everything. You don't become like a, you know, my favorite philosopher, Sharon, you don't end up like him, like down in the dumps, and, you know. Have that agonized look on your face like you want to jump off a building. Although you can have your moments, your Sharon moments for sure. I hope you do but don't linger long. But there is that sense of, wow, you know, how do, I, how do I live if the life to which I have been accustomed for so long, the parties, the gatherings, the kind of events that gave them color and a kind of excitement, seems so just kind of pointless, complicated discussions, hot-headed discussions about politics that used to be interesting, or even our friends, seeing our friends' lives and the kind of complications that people live in that to us were like the complications we lived in. And then as you practice, as you start to see the patterns of your own mind, you see how much a shadow world it is and it doesn't excite you and you see a, a stability behind it, never changing. So what do you do? And um, I know especially when I grew into the practice and started to have the eyes opened about much in my own mind and then therefore in the minds of the world that I had created through relationships and the value system that I went in, it was really a struggle. Kind of cracks appeared in my view of the world. And it's just, it's just like physics, when an object change from, changes from one steady state to another, stresses appear in the, in the object. If you, take a, if you take a frozen beer mug that's been frozen in the freezer, 
frosted beer mug and you boil up in your water boiler container water and you pour the boiling water directly into the frozen mug, it's going to crack. Yes, this changing from one steady state to another can be, in some cases, radical. And so we have, with sometimes with practitioners, this painful transition of a view. And is that something you always need to be connected with Sangha with, to have that balanced and, and supported and understood by others? This work of Zen is not feel-good meditation, as I've often said, and Desan Sanin too, used to say, um, relaxation, good feeling, not good feeling meditation. Good feeling meditation is not correct meditation. He would say that, good feeling. Good feeling meditation is not true meditation. We get good feelings from meditation, but that's not the goal. That's not the thrust. It's insight. It's waking up. And waking up can be a, an interesting. Movement. It's an interesting poem that um, Desantin wrote. Of all of his poems, I think it's the one I love the most. We've put it, I believe, on our website. Is this on our website, Yanis? Yeah. This, go, this, this is on the letter that people get if they want to attend the retreat. So if people aren't applying to attend the retreat, they don't get the poem. Uh, we we got to put this on the website. This is this is just brilliant. This is from his book Bone of Space, which was his collection of poetry. Did a lot of really fascinating poetry. Some of it really crazy. And um, freedom style, freedom expression. And this one is the great one. So I'm going to read it. Flowers in the spring. In the summer, cool breezes. Leaves in the fall. In the winter, pure snow. Is the world throwing me away? Am I throwing away the world? I just hang around in the Dharma room. I don't care about anything. White clouds floating in the sky, clear water flows down the mountain, the wind through the pagoda. I surrender my whole life to that. That's a Zen poem. That's a Zen poem. That speaks to this. Dilemma of the practitioner, although it's in some ways not a dilemma, but it's experienced that way. The, the question of the practitioner. Am I throwing, is the world throwing me away? You know, when you do a few retreats and this starts to settle into your life and the view, the stability, just now mind, the, the completeness, the adequacy of just now mind. When you see, you just see. When you hear, you just hear. When you smell, you just smell. When you taste, you just taste. Just, just like this. Truth, just like this. The completeness of that. The, the, just this complete satisfaction of that. Once that starts to get... Once that view starts to get so stable, then all of the complicated thinking and, and twisted emotional yearning, fearing, doubting, holding of life that constitutes most relationship. If we notice often, it's funny when you notice when you do retreat, um, 
I remember the first time I did a very intense solo retreat, long solo retreat. Um, it was 35 days in a cabin in um, Western Massachusetts. And it was very isolated. It's like there's nothing for miles around. No electricity, no running water in the cabin. Just a, a cabin as big as a storage shed, a lawn shed at someone's house. Really small, just enough for a bed, a heating stove where I burned wood to, to make rice once a day. I would make a pot of rice and then just eat the rice in the morning and eat the rice at lunch. Very strong. Lots of bowing. I was doing just maniac level bowing for the mantra for the great Durrani. Chanting, lots of chanting, and sitting. And I was completely cut off. And boy, wow, that kind of a night when there's nothing, no lights around. There's no electricity, it's just your candlelight. It's really fantastic. I actually fantasize about going back there and doing another retreat there sometime. It was really powerful coming back to the city, coming back to Cambridge, Massachusetts after that retreat. And going into a coffee shop, it's Cambridge, Massachusetts, Central Square, Cambridge Zen Center was where I was kind of based then. Um, and going into the coffee shop and then yeah, maybe I, yeah, I went into a store to get some things and just doing shopping in the square there. It's located midway between MIT and Harvard on the red line, the Boston transit system, the, their metro, the subway, the T. So there's all these shops in the neighborhood. And sitting once in a coffee shop, having a coffee, just back from the mountains. Remember, my clothing still smelled like burning wood from the wood-burning stove. I didn't want to wash it, actually. Uh, sitting in the coffee shop and struck the music playing, the background, just pop music, the usual stuff that we're so used to we don't even notice until we practice. Now you notice it all the time. It's terrible. I remember sitting there and had this like really penetrating realization that I could feel it for the very, very, very first time, totally fresh, totally new, that it's all sadness and suffering. You know, they say pop songs. A good pop song has to have a hook. You can write any pop song in the world, but if it doesn't have a hook, it's not going to succeed. It won't get listened to. It won't get accepted by a record company. Now you can upload anything onto SoundCloud and they become famous, but it's got to have a hook for people to like it. Anyone in the industry says, what's the hook? And I'd heard that kind of speech you know, it's part of the culture. Make a pitch. What's your hook? Make a pitch for the project, but you got to have a hook. It comes from that. It was amazing. Sitting there in the coffee shop, it really hit me what the hook is. Each song has a different hook, of course, but it's the same source. It's suffering. Some longing. Some triggering of some primal something. And that's what gets people interested in it. That's what keeps people hooked. Something here, something in the psychology. So coming back from that kind of retreat and seeing like, I, yeah, I, I can't do this anymore. This is not, um, this is not truth. This is, a, this is a, a, a gross manipulation that we've all agreed on together. And we've gone to sleep because it's been beaten into our heads enough. And, 
and that I could feel the pain of it. I could feel the pain of pop songs. I could feel how that pain then gets you into a painful state where you want to block it out with some food and buy, oh, maybe I'll have another cupcake. Well, I shouldn't, but while I'm sitting here, and I kind of feel a little bit like it would be good. It would be nice. So you're countering these sensations with one another. You're adding and, and subtracting things to kind of recounter this stimulus, not just the music, the faces, the energy, the pace, the stress of the city, but the whole mixture of it designed by human thinking around this principle of feeling alive through suffering, like a self, like someone who slices themselves, a self-harming. I was reading something recently that recent psychological research indicates that this self-harming that is so prevalent is much more prevalent than we realize and that it is not it used to be symptomatic of something so it's just used as a sign of something oh he's doing that therefore there must be now they're realizing it is a condition itself it is itself a condition of mind it can also indicate things so I saw how much of life was this, just this accepted self-harming. And that was where it was just, no, I, just this backing up. This is not something I'm going to re-enter. This is not acceptable anymore. This is not a real life. So that, that waking up from it, You can get this, and some of our people who've done retreats here have gone back to the life, what their friends are interested in and driven by and, and obsessed with. And wrapped up in, that these things they start to notice that they too were involved with deeply, moved by, motivated for, are so much less attractive. In fact, somewhat depressing. Once the, once the veil comes off your eyes, wow. And so there, is, there can be this feeling of a kind of alienation, especially because you go back to your own life. It's just you and your family. You're the weirdo. So it can be hard to look into that. That's why Sangha is really important. So this poem is so powerful. Flowers in the spring, in the summer, cool breezes. Leaves in the fall, in the winter, pure snow. So a great Zen poem, Desansen used to say, starts off with truth. Some statement of truth. That's a Zen poem. Zen poem isn't a great, um, like, great poetry will be the artist basically referring to themselves, often their cleverness, their reference to something that's like, yeah, only people who are on the in get that reference to T.S. Eliot that I put in there, but I twisted it around and did it in a back meter way so that it's cool, it shows that I know T.S. Eliot, you know, that's a the four cantos, you know, it's like no one really gets that. You get it? That's cool. So most poetry has this intellectual gamesmanship. Most art. Most displays of human thinking. Not to put down artists, poets, or anything like that. For sure, this is uh, there's many poets of truth. But he said for a Zen poem, a Zen poem must reveal truth first. There must be some statement of truth. Flowers in the spring. Yeah, you look out the window now. We can look out the window now. We don't see them directly. We, we can look out our windows of our houses and our little quarantine and see, oh yeah, the flowers are coming back. Flowers in the spring. In the summer, cool breezes. Leaves fall in the fall. And in the winter, pure snow. Truth, just like this. Then he says, a Zen poem should have a question. 
this great doubt, this great question. A Zen poem is not a display of some artful knowledge or skill. A Zen poem is about Zen. What is Zen? Well, Zen is not a tradition or a um, technique. Or Zen just means this investigation of what is the meaning of life and death. What? Did you hear that? What? What is the, what is, what, what? That's a question mark. So a Zen poem has this question mark in it somehow. It doesn't have to have a physical one. But something about the reality is like this, but this. Because we all have that walking down the street. We have that encountering our lives. Especially now, we have that big time. So this is great. This line is, is the world throwing me away? Now you could, the world sounds kind of big. Are my friends throwing me away? Is my social group throwing me away? Oh, you do those retreats all the time. I think that's enough. It's not like the third time you've done that retreat. Really? It's okay. Well, we have this big event. Don't you want to do, you know. Is the world throwing me away? Are my friends, is my family throwing me away? Or am I throwing away the world? That's a really powerful, you know, we're involved in this practice. There's no turning back. The story I often talk about, Chogyam Trungpa, in Boulder, Colorado, the first Shambhala centers, and he would often answer the door himself. There was no internet in those days, 1970s, 1980s, so people came to the door. Often they didn't know what he looked like, just from a book. They didn't often have the picture. He was dressed like a regular guy with a, sometimes a t-shirt or a, a, a necktie and a shirt. And when they rang the doorbell and he would answer the door, oh yes, welcome, oh yes, we want to be here. Why do you want to learn the, Buddhism or meditation. Oh, we want to understand ourselves. That's why we came. We hear there's a course at 7 o'clock. We would like to find out what is, what is our true self. And he would say, better you never heard of this. But having started it, best that you complete it. It's a very important story in American the history of the transmission of the Dharma. So this is really powerful. Is the world throwing me away, or am I throwing away the world? Many of you, especially doing this retreat uh, in coronavirus time, but the family of everyone, many people are bored. There's a movie, or maybe there's a, you know, Breaking Bad is on, let's watch it right after dinner. And no, I, gotta, I'm, I have this meditation with this crazy monk in Germany I, I need to do. I kind of promised my friends or Facebook, my Instagram world of things I do. I something maybe connect. Or I, but you did it last night. I mean, you did it last week too. How, how much are you going to do? Isn't that a little bit? Yeah. You have to constantly revisit this intention you have inside. So this is this point that he said, better you never heard of this before. Or you come out into the TV room after your meditation now, maybe in a few minutes, and you see that, you know, someone just like passed out in front of the TV and they got a bag of chips half open on the thing, and, you know, they're kind of just flipping around the TV or on some smartphone game or something like that. And there's a part of you that's like, wow, like, are they rejecting me in this? Is their life rejecting me or am I rejecting that? So we have this, it just speaks to that question we can have as practitioners. It's so powerful. You read that, it's like, yep, you see it, sir. You get it. Even he's a great practitioner. He's a great Zen master, but he had that, clearly. He wrote this in 1977, 78, 79. He'd already been, a, he's already 50-something years old. Big enlightenment. But he's like, is the world throwing me away? Am I just something useless and purposeless to the world? And again, not the global world, although that's there, but my friends, is my social group throwing me away? Or am I throwing them away? It's a question, the dilemma, that's it. What is this? What is that? 
beautiful. I hang around in the Dharma room. I don't care about it. I do these stupid meditation sessions that this happens on the live stream every day. I don't care about it. I don't care if people agree with it or don't. I don't care if people get it or don't. I don't care if it's cool or not, or the situation. I just hang around doing this, and I don't care about anything else. I mean, you do. We have to. We're not here to be anything, like a robot, or, or, or even anyone who gets a cynical view of the experiences of people who don't practice like this. There's other ways people practice, of course. It doesn't mean that, like, I don't care about that, but it's like, you know, this question of, am I throwing the world away, or is the world throwing me away? I, I get that too. Sometimes it's important, I've never said this in public, but kind of interesting maybe for this. I, you know, I mean, I, I graduated from Yale College in 1987, and Several people who were on campus the same time I was on campus. You, know, you get this once. I used to go home. I haven't seen this in years since my parents died and that sold the house. But I would come home from retreats in Korea. These intensive retreats in the icy mountains, and come back to well, once every year and a half. I would visit my parents maybe once in two years, but especially to see my mother, who I love dearly. Uh, I would make an effort if I could save up money uh, to go home. And when I would get home, they would have this stack of mail for me. Um, there wasn't much mail. I didn't have any bills or billing address, but the main thing would be the Yale Alumni Magazine would be that. Be, you know, all the issues. They made sure they saved. I think they were like still poking me like, hmm? you, you could be having this life. And, you know, I'd sit down on the couch and sometimes, you know, would go through it sometimes, and they'd have the alumni, you know, by year, what they're doing now. All these proud letters, like, yeah, it's after I wrote my third book, I'm now tenured at, you know, at, at, at Columbia University, and I've got this, you know, great, I gave the symposium at the White House on blah, 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 and I'm, you know, I'm leading a cruise of people around the world, and I'm going to be interviewed on the Dateline NBC, or whatever, just, there'd be all these, like, amazing accomplishments of the people that I went to school with. And some of them did some really amazing things. One guy who I was actually friends with on campus um, was the spokesman for Barack Obama in the White House. He was the guy who was on TV every single day on CNN and all the news reports for Obama for like I, about four years. I think he was the longest serving press secretary Jay Carney, really nice guy, you know, did journalism. We both did journalism. I did the Yale Daily News. He did another thing, and he went off and did his own thing and went on. And Time Magazine reporter, Moscow bureau chief, boom, 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 boom. Spokesperson for Obama, lots of pictures with him, with Obama in the White House, sleeves rolled up, you know, laughing and doing the serious work that Obama was engaged in. And I would see, this is my crowd, you know, I mean, was at some point for four years somewhat my crowd. Did I throw that away? Or did they, by their insistence on regularness and just go along and the cheap artificial thing of, not that stuff that Jay did was cheap, I think, especially if you work for Obama, please. I'm very grateful for that. But or did, they th or did that value system throw me away? Am I useless for that? Am I just some turd? Because I look at matters of life and death and they affect me. I can't just let it go. That this existence has this something dimension. So I'm very powerful about that. Is the world throwing me away? Or did I throw away the world? Uh, did I throw away the world or did it throw me? I don't know. 
I just hang around in the dorm room and basically I don't give a shit. That's my New Jersey take on that. Hey, I don't know, what the hell? I'm just here, I just sit in the dorm room and what the hell? That's, I, I, I can't give a shit about that question. Basically, that's the insight of that. Sorry, this sounds to me, that's a New Jersey style. Dan, this is great, the ending is. White clouds floating in the sky. Clear water flows down the mountain. The wind through the pagoda. I surrender my whole life to that. Oh, it's just this, it's like, you take the breath away. So there's this, first is this statement of truth. The first four lines state the truth of the world as it is. It's speaking from a reality. This is not from some scripture. It's not from some old book. It doesn't speak with the authority of some divine being or even if some Zen master. This is not quoted from some ancient reference to an ancient reference to an ancient something. It's just truth. It just speaks from the authority of truth as it is that anyone's eyes can confirm. Flowers in the spring. In the summer, cool breezes. Leaves in the fall, in the winter, pure snow. This is just truth as it is. Mirror. Red comes red, white comes white. Spring comes, flowers. Winter comes, snow. So it's just speaking with the authority of truth like this. Beautiful. Second stanza, the dilemma, the question. Is the world throwing me away? Or am I throwing away the world? And we have that. It's not just this question of this. We have that. Is my, is, is, is my, marriage, prob is my marriage no longer suitable for me? Or am I no longer suitable for my marriage? Is my social group no longer fitting me? Or do I no longer fit the social work? So our mind goes in this, we can have that flip, 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 flip. And then we get stuck in that vibrato of worry. So it presents that beautifully. Such a jewel. Mm, I hang around in the dorm room. I don't care about anything of this. That matter of looking at it that way. Third stanza. White clouds floating in the sky. Now it's the first stanza was this four seasons, this universal truth of time. Now there's this just now, this just now. That's spring, summer, fall, winter. That's, well, now is spring. So the fall view, it's, it's not a concept, but it's a statement of time. This revolving of time is like that. In the middle of this second stanza, I have this dilemma. Third stanza, just now mind. It's not a future spring or fall or autumn truth. It's the truth of right now. Looking out the window. White clouds float in the sky. Clear water flows down the mountain. The wind blowing through the pagoda. I surrender my whole life to them. Which means I surrender life to now. I give my whole life to Right here, right now. Just everything goes limp. Everything just goes limp at that. All of the tension is just dispersed.
the truth of time and seasons. In the middle of that, we live this life with this question. All I can do is practice. I love how the second stanza ends up with practice. Some do it. Some kind of do it. I just hang around in the karma. I don't think about to be or not to be. Hamlet's whole dilemma is that he just stays stuck in the thought about it. He can't get out of the ratiocination. To be or not to be. To stay in this relationship or to leave the relationship. Well, if I do, but someone said this and my friend said this and this, this. But someone said this and someone said this. That's Hamlet. And we know what ineffective result it ended up in. Lots of dead bodies. Ophelia is crazy floating in a river somewhere. <laughs> Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. His mother's crazy. Hamlet too ends up dead. So that's not the way to answer. It's beautiful about this poem. This poem contains Right there, second paragraph. To be or not to be. I just go into my practice. I don't give a shit about anything. About either one of those dilemmas. Of course you give a shit about everything. That's why you practice. But not in that, is it this or is it that? Way of giving a shit. That's a shitty way to give a shit. Don't care about it. Just return to the breath. Just this question. That question, what am I? Am I throwing them away? So that doesn't mean you avoid the question. Just integrate it into your practice. Not in the head, conceptually. It's just part of the big question of like, yeah, also, why was I born? And why was I born in this situation? And kids were born in Africa in that situation. Why do good people die early and often bad, evil people live along? Why, why, why? That big, the 10,000 questions are one question. What am I? So I love that second stanza. Yeah, could be this, could be that. I sit around the dorm room with it. I don't give a shit about anything. And then from that, the third stanza is just this just now mind view. It's not telling you to get that. It's just the result of sitting. You know that when you do practice. There's just the floor's breath. The wall is white. The sound of the bells outside right now. Happening. I surrender my whole life to them. Which means to moment. So much gratitude, this poem. It's one of the greatest Zen poems ever written. It has the path right in it. It's not a piece of art making a nice mellifluousness of speech. It says, what, it says how you do it. Just return to your practice. You know. You know. Return to your practice. And then trust what <coughs> appears. Maybe if you're in Greece right now hearing this, it's the birds outside your room that you hear. The sound of a dog barking next door. I surrender my whole life to them. I surrender my life to moments. Mm. So.
So that's a Zen poem. Zen poem has some truth, question, function. Return to this. What kind of function? See the floor, it's brown. Smell the room, incense. You hear the computer fan moving right now. Returns to right now. That has no to be or not to be anymore. It's complete experience right here. It's radical. So radical. It's not a good idea. Zen poem doesn't give you a good idea. It points back to truth just like this. What we're doing And the poem doesn't have a title either. It doesn't have an idea. It's just a mirror. It's like four minutes and 33 seconds. 